I'm here. Hello, my name is John Peters. I'm a Dutchman, and I'm one of the co-owners of Holition from London, responsible for the global business development, and I do that also for our partner agency, Moritz Waldemeyer. My colleagues and myself, we speak frequently on conferences all over the world about the digital disruption in the retail space, and I will do that here today, too. Holition, it all started uh, just before the launch of the iPhone, just before Twitter came on the market, and in those days when my colleagues founded the agency, uh, Facebook only had 1.2 million subscriptions, uh, which were students at American universities. And they started the agency out of frustration, out of frustration because the luxury brands they worked for uh, were quite re um, reluctant towards digital. In the luxury world, it's all about the weight of the Rolex watch, the smell and the quality of the leather, the stitching of a, bir uh, of a Birkin uh, bag, etc. Um, and the real important things for luxury, like uh, provenance, creativity, craftsmanship, heritage, history, etc., you can't put them in a digital device. And in case you can, it would commoditize digital, uh, sorry, luxury, and that was bad and not something to look at. So my colleagues thought, well, we understand luxury, we come from luxury, we embrace digital, let's bring those worlds together. And that's uh, where they started at that moment. I'm not a technologist, neither are the founders of Holition. Uh, but yet we seem to be a technology company because everything we do has a, uh, a technical edge to it. Mm. We are much more interested in the role of technology, especially the role of technology between old school luxury and this emerging digital interested consumer. So what you see here is the famous map of Facebook with all the subscriptions and how they are connected all over the world. But actually, this map tells you much, much more. It tells you that digital is able to break through barriers all over the world, barriers regarding age, gender, geography, uh, race, and religious, religion. It actually it tells you that um, digital brings the world uh, together in a way much more powerful than there was uh, available before uh, digital actually arrived. And the digital disruption is caused by this kind of uh, communication, this kind of two-way communication. About 10 to 15 years ago, brands were only talking at consumers. It was one-way uh, communication. They told you what to wear, what to like, how to behave, etc., etc. But nowadays, we all have a voice, we all have a vision, we have our network, we have our social media. And think about the vloggers and the bloggers and the power they have. Uh, so, today we have our two-way communication and we can talk at people, we can have conversations. Uh, and one who really understood this idea of two-way communication was Steve Jobs. And he actually called it uh, the infinite loop. It was at the very heart of everything what Apple did. And with the infinite loop, he meant the phenomena of, that, uh, of a connection between a brand and a consumer that is so strong that that same consumer would buy automatically the next new product of that brand. And we all know the phenomena of uh, Apple fans queuing in front of an Apple store when a new iPhone will be launched. And he actually called the street of his headquarter after this idea. It's called One Infinite Loop. But in his later years, he slightly modified this idea of the infinite loop. And he called it the feedback loop, where a brand pushes content into the community. Consumers receive that content, digest it, modify it, share it in their network, and then they push it out again back to the brand, which receives it as new content, and that goes on and on and on. So that's where, where we were. That's where uh, we are right now in the world of luxury. And the world of luxury is the last one who is uh, really open to adopt innovative technology. But there is one brand who is really uh, going into it, and that's this one, Burberry. This is a, a, a picture of a camera dolly during a... Um, fashion show two years ago, just before the launch of the iPhone 5. They filmed the entire fashion show with iPhones, instead of traditional big, heavy TV cameras. 
And what they were actually doing and telling to the audience was, hey, dear, dear visitors of our fashion show, we are actually the same as you. We film it just the way you film it. We send it out to our network just as you are sending it out to your network. And this was the first so-called democratized fashion show. Here you see a limited overview of our uh, client portfolio. And many of them are uh, high-end luxury brands. And what all those high-end luxury brands have in common are the stages in which they are when they deploy immersive digital technology in store. And the luxury brands mostly are in stage one, two, and three. When they start with immersive digital experiences in the store, it's not in the store. It's in an art gallery, it's online, or during a pop-up event on a trade fair, etc. The next stage is they do it close to the store, just in a store window and temporarily. And the third stage is they take it actually in store, but only for a limited period. Stage four and five, you will not see them in the luxury world. Stage four is for a few brands outside of the luxury world. And stage five, I don't think there are brands in the world who have immersive digital experiences in all their stores globally. So, and now I'm going to show you now a few examples of projects of luxury brands in stage one, two, and three. This was actually our very, very first project many years ago for Tissot, the Swiss watchmaker. They make watches, they sell them to retailers, and the retailers uh, sell them to the end consumers. But the retailers never gave back the data uh, to Tissot, and Tissot wanted to build a database. And uh, we helped them with that, and we did it in this way. This was an advertising campaign. This was an advertising campaign in the UK. People had to buy a magazine. They had to tear out a paper watch. They had to do it around their wrist. They had to go to the website of Tissot. They had to fill in their email address, their gender, and their date of birth. And at, from that moment on, they got immediately access at home to 32 different watches of Tissot, which they could try on in real time, at home behind, behind their own PC. This campaign lasted two weeks in the UK. And within two weeks, Tissot had 162,000 different email addresses to start their database with. They were, they were quite pleased with that result. And uh, this is what we call the online version. And we developed after this the in-store version for them. This was Harrods in London. They had a theme called Swiss Weeks. In every store window was another Swiss brand. There was a promotion team of Tissot standing outside on the sidewalk. They stopped people who passed by. They handed over those paper watches. And people tried the digital watch in the store window. But what actually happened was that a lot of these people who passed by by coincidence because they left the office for a sandwich during lunch or whatever, they went into Harrods to the Tissot shop and shop to try on the real watch. We also did the same campaign with Tissot at Selfridges in London, and Selfridges provided us the data after their campaign of two weeks. And you see, those results were quite, um, quite pleasing for them and also for Tissot. And Tissot went with this campaign to 30 major cities all over the world where they had Tissot shop and shops in department stores. And we did something similar for Boucheron. Boucheron is a very high-priced jewelry brand from uh, Plus Vendôme in Paris. For those of you who are not um, familiar uh, with, uh, with Boucheron, it's so high-priced when you buy a piece of jewelry over there, you get a handsome bodyguard for free. And, um, we, we did this for them. It's similar to Tissot, but now for jewelry, for rings, for bracelets, uh, etc. Uh, we did it also for one of the brands of De Beers with earrings and pendants, so that people can try on at home the expensive jewelry of those kind of brands. And yes, Louis Vuitton. This is a project of their pop-up store in Selfridges in London. It was there for a year, and it was the very first time that Louis Vuitton took digital into a store. And they were always very reluctant towards digital, because in their opinion, uh, to bring digital in, into a store, that means screens and PCs and wires. And that was a horror scenario for them, because they have their beautiful stores, and they don't want those things like PCs and screens in the store. So we solved that for them by, by telling them um, use something which is already there and change that into something digital. And what's in a Louis Vuitton store, that's a table. So what we did was we uh, um, 
switch the top of the table with a screen. And when you take a product of Louis Vuitton from the shelf and you put it on the table, then suddenly the, t the screen opens. And then the screen shows you complementary products that go with the physical product. And the screen starts to ask you questions like, is it for a man or is it for a woman? Is it for business or is it for leisure? And every time when you touch the relevant answer, the complementary products change. So it's a kind of a sales assistant that helps the customer to go through in an easy way uh, th uh, through the whole product range of Louis Vuitton. But they only did it for a year. So this is an example of an immersive digital install experience, but just temporary. There are several reasons why many brands get tech wrong into a store. Many who bring technology into a store are believing that it um, makes a stronger connection between a brand and a consumer. We see a lot of tech in store all over the world. And we are convinced that in over 80% of those digital solutions, it, it is doing actually the opposite of it. It builds actually a barrier between a brand and a consumer. And there are several reasons for it. The first reason is it's very difficult to get to, uh, people to use tech. Maybe you experienced by yourself or you saw it on a YouTube uh, uh, movies. When there is tech in store, often it is accompanied by uh, a staff member. A staff member that persuades the customer to approach the tech, explains how it works, and helps the customer to experience uh, what's, uh, what the tech is for. One of the legacies of Steve Jobs was that he reduced the distance between humans and technology. We all have our smartphones. We download apps. There is not even one app that goes with a manual. We download an app, we open it, we navigate through the app, we make mistakes, we close the app, we open it again, and that's quite a private experience in your own comfort zone. You can't expect from a customer in the middle of a store, surrounded by many other customers, to do that same experience what he does on a smartphone. It makes him, it gives him the feeling he looks like an idiot. And that's why often tech doesn't work in, st in store. It's just there, it stays there, and people walk around. Tech has got to be beautiful. There is many tech in store that looks poor, ugly, etc. This is one example. When you go to a store and you want to buy a suit or a dress, you put it on, you're standing in front of the mirror, and then you want to look attractive, beautiful, cool, elegant, sexy. This is none of that. So digital should start where the real thing ends. And the real thing is a mirror. And if it doesn't do that, it damages your brand, and it's a waste of money. So there is too much complex UX and unbeautiful experiences, and the goal should be meaningful UX and beautiful execution, really beautiful execution. And this might be an example of that. This is uh, a flagship store of Uniqlo in San Francisco, and we solved the issue for many men you don't have to try on the jacket, many jackets anymore because Uniqlo is about many colors. Just put on one jacket, and if the fitting is right, in the mirror, only the colors change. And something similar we did for a flagship store of uh, Vans in uh, Los Angeles. So this guy, this is in our studio in London, the real one is, is in Los Angeles. This guy is wearing regular shoes. He's not wearing van shoes. But in the mirror, he sees himself with the van shoes projected onto his real shoes. This is my colleague who developed it. He's holding the real shoes in his hand to compare the designs and the colors, with the real ones. But you see, he's just trying on, in a digital way, the van shoes. And then we played around with the phenomena of, uh, of a magic mirror. 
This is to create a PR buzz, a social, social media buzz around the brand Moet and Chandon. This is Stanley Tucci, the famous actor. He's playing around digital champagne. And here you see Sting, the rock star, having fun with spray, spraying around uh, digital champagne and sharing it over social media. The last reason why many brands get tech wrong in the store is too many rely on screens. When you go to a media market, then it's obviously you are, uh, that you will look at screens because they sell TVs. When you go to the cinema, then it's clear that you will look at, uh, at a screen. You are here now attending a conference and watching a screen. But you're not going to stores to watch something on screens. And still, a lot of brands are forcing us to do that. A very famous example is the uh, Burberry flagship store in Regent Street in London. As soon as you enter the store, and the store is really beautiful, a staff member approaches you and shows you something on his iPad and starts a conversation with you. You could have that same conversation on a park bench outside of the store. Brands spend fortunes on beautiful architecture. There is beautiful merchandise, so why are we looking at screens and looking down at screens in stores? So there should be a way how, can, how digital should be relevant uh, for the physical space. There should be a way how we can uh, make digital to celebrate and support the digital space. And it's quite difficult, but hey, we're working on that. Yes. Digital enables you to beautify the, the ordinary. I told you already before, digital has to be beautiful. But you don't always need the latest, most innovative, uh, state-of-the-art technology. We always say, try all technology and do it with a digital twist. And I have a few examples of that. One of them is a hologram. A hologram is already one, more than 150 years old. It's from, uh, I think, 1860 by John Henry Pepper. In the old days, he did it with glass windows and mirrors. Nowadays, we do it with uh, foil and pro, uh, projectors. I'm going to show you a fashion show of Dunhill in Shanghai. Imagine a large conference room. In the middle of that conference room, there is a stage. On that stage are 64 models just standing there wearing the new collection of Alfred Dunhill. And Dunhill wanted not only to show the new collection to the audience in Shanghai, they also wanted to show uh, their core values of the brand to the audience over there. One of the core values is Britishness. So what we did is we created content of the four British seasons, and we showed that to the audience over there. On that stage are 64 models, 500 people sitting at this side of the stage and 500 people sitting over there. When you go to the cinema, you go to a 3D movie, you buy a ticket, they hand you over dark glasses, you sit down, the movie starts, you put on the glasses, and then you experience everything in 3D. But you already know that because you chose a 3D movie. These people then was told nothing uh, in advance, no one is wearing dark glasses, but they will experience everything in 3D. This is a hologram of 10 meters high, 28 meters wide, double-sided. Um, the actual show lasted 12 minutes, and now you see a compilation of just two minutes. And everything except the models and the new collection is a hologram.
yes, uh, when the show was over, the lights went out for a few seconds because we had to remove the screen. And then the lights went on again. And the models were still standing on that stage. And a lot of uh, people from the audience, they walked up, uh, up the stage. Of course, to look at the collection from a close distance. But there were also a lot of people, when they walked up to the stage, they were looking at the floor. Just looking at the grass and the flowers. They just didn't get what happened over there. And Dunhill uploaded a, a video of this event on social media in Asia. And within a few days, it was shared and viewed over a few million times. This was my first an example of to beautify the ordinary. Uh, the second example uh, will be a project with mirrors. It's an old technology, a mirror. It, uh, it exists already for many, many centuries. And when you put three, uh, two min uh, mirrors exactly opposite of each other, and you put something in between, that, uh, that object will be infinitized because of the reflection into eternity, into infinity. So, what you're going to see is an experience house of Dom Pirignon in London. It was a pop-up event. And in that experience house, we built an infinity room. It was a room of approximately four by five meters, completely clattered, also the ceiling, with many mirrors. And we projected content on those mirrors, and there was uh, a kind of music and a low voice telling the story of Dom Pirignon Champagne. When the people entered the room, they were surrounded by this kind of image, images, this kind of music, and a low voice telling the story of Dom Perignon. And we heard from the visitors, their experience was when they entered it, they, would, they had the feeling they were sucked into the world of champagne. The next project, this will really take off the next coming, uh, the next couple of years. Augmented reality in beauty sector. And it's not about the virtual try-on of makeup. It goes much, much further. I'll explain it to you uh, soon. First, you see my colleague Maria who discovered this, who, sorry, who developed this. So this will this is now also available in Germany because actually Douglas was our very first client. This is available for lipstick, lip gloss, lip liner, eyeshadow, eyeliner, uh, mascara, blusher and foundation, everything in real time. But this is just the basic. This will enable brands to have in the future real one-to-one -one conversations with each individual uh, customer. These kind of platforms will be uh, connected to big data, to loyalty uh, systems, and to social media profiles. Because of the splintering, the splintering of the mass media, brands are looking for ways to have one-to-one -one conversations with their customers. And for sure, this will happen in the beauty industry. But this was just the basics. It starts with the virtual try-on. But you can do many, many more things. I will show you one feature. So imagine you are reading a magazine and you see a model with a great look. How would that look look on you? So with this application, you can scan it from the ad and then it's projected in real time onto your face. And it goes further. This is Rimmel. We developed this, uh, this application for them, not only to scan images from a magazine, but imagine you are in the office, and a colleague comes in. And that colleague has a great makeup look. And you think by yourself, hmm, how would that look on me? Then you take your smartphone, you scan her face, the application um, analyzes the colors and the shapes, and then you can see yourself with the look in real time of your colleague. And it, it's just starting. Soon there will be augmented real, uh, reality tutorials 
because it's quite difficult for a lot of women to do those great, beautiful looks. You have to go to a makeup artist in a department store or into a Douglas, and they can do it for you. It's quite difficult to do it by yourself. In the, in the near future, these kind of devices will tell you exactly on your face where to apply the makeup. And then you... Actually, we are putting a makeup artist into the digital device. And we modified this application also to develop world's, world's first digital nail polish for the brand Sally Hansen. And the big brands are really going into this right now. Yes, something completely different. This is more an art-related retail project rather than a um, uh, in-store retail. How much time do I have? Uh, since five minutes, it's over. But I, as you were the last speaker, I was like really nice to you. And oh, okay. Didn't oh. want to interrupt too much, but, but I saw, and I saw that you had like 20 more slides. I was like, no, sorry, we can't do that. Okay. I, I didn't give the others more time. I have to be really. Well, it's up to the audience, here. but okay. Um, yeah, but would you have some like a last sentence to wrap this up? Uh, yes, uh, there is too much technology in the world that is a solution which is looking for a problem. <laughs> That's a good one. And it should be the other way, way around. It's all about strategy. And while you're trying to achieve that strategy, you will run into issues. And for those issues, you have to come up with creative ideas. And then you choose the most appropriate technology. Never, ever start with technology. It's the, it's the wrong way. That's a good one. I invite you to stay with me here on stage for the next two minutes because I do the wrap-up of the day. Um, is there anything specifically other than your talk you learned from the, from the other talks, what you heard, something that pops up your head? Well, uh, a, a lot of speeches today were focused on, on, on the technology. Oh, really? But in this room, not in the other? Uh, in, in this? Mm -hmm. At least I, I, I didn't hear here all day, but the ones I heard was about technology. And of course, that, that's important, but it's a complete different angle than where we start from. W technology is fine, yeah. but it starts with something else. So from your point of view, uh, technology is the vehicle to tell a good story. Absolutely. Yeah. We heard a lot of people talking about storytelling today, so maybe you missed Astrid or Alicia talking about storytelling. Um, so I wrote a couple of things down from today, what I learned. So you should check out subreddit, which is the front page of the internet. Uh, that's what Dominic Escovier told us this morning. Uh, I also learned maybe that, that VR could replace um, car prototyping, because we can put people into this environment without paying like two or uh, one or two million for a car prototype. Not we, but the companies. What I also learned um, that AR sh might be mainstream in five years, so maybe the Gardner hype uh, curve is correct. We'll see. Um, but that's what our speaker said, and I'm pretty convinced after this talk. Um, when we're talking about technology, it is a lot about high frame rate because that brings us really to this um, realistic environment, what we want to approach here. Uh, what else did I learn? Um, you should go to the VR um, day after the Animago, uh, which is in Munich, and that's where Astrid Kampf is talking and presenting a lot of other uh, uh, people in the environment, um, and talking a lot about uh, storytelling and also much, not too much about technology. Um, what else? Oh, you should subscribe to the Digital Concert Hall of the Berlin Philharmonics. Uh, I have a uh, subscription. It's pretty fun if you are into uh, classic music and want to um, relax. Um, tomorrow, you should go to the Google uh, Tango uh, workshop. Actually, it's the workshop with Cologne Intelligence, where they talk about indoor navigation with Google and Google Tango. Um, and um, I'm really happy that Ola really said something about the Uncanny Valley and, and putting that all together. Um, that is about craftsmanship, and actually that's the, the opposite point of yours, but we all have different views on that because we're coming from different sides, and that's what I think is really important in that virtual environment. It's, it's holistic and it's interdisciplinarity. Um, but I learned from your side that 
luxury brands are really looking into that. And um, I also um, was surprised, but maybe maybe my colleagues would know more about that, um, that you have something like the virtual mirror, so where would be, where you have the brand, where, those, uh, where I can see the shoe that I don't have on, but I see it in this virtual mirror in front. So I think um, we worked on that in 2009, and I'm happy to see that this is now in store, that they really <laughs> use that. Um, so, and I couldn't listen until the end what Clemens said earlier, because I had to do my own presentation, but I want to, uh, I quoted you, by the way, in my presentation, so I want to wrap this up with um, this quote from Benjamin Franklin, which was, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. That, I think, will bring us to tomorrow's speeches. I can't point out anything of that, because they all are highlights. There's not one highlight, they all are highlights. Um, and I would like to invite you to come next week. If you don't have anything else to do, there is more VR going on in Karlsruhe at the ZKM, um, where they talk a lot about brands, arts, and virtual reality. And you heard earlier on that there is another thing going on in Los Angeles, which was the 13th and 15th of uh, October. So, a lot VR. Uh, enjoy the evening. I learned a lot. I hope you too. Thank you. <laughs>